uh, we are here for the uh, we are or part one of our member that we had most of part one we had faced with respect to you know the internet and band so uh, what I sort of promised on is we going to week uh, sort of we will also webinar and it's, it's primarily because today's session Indian invest and he has to conduct a sort of hearing a matter we are uh, since the sessions were the inquiry and invest um, it kind of uh, works well that we we'll... so uh, we will go on a little longer than we 30 minutes is the time uh, 30 to 45 minutes is is the typical time we budget for. Uh, probably a little more than an hour we get and, and so on and so forth today i uh, must give you be doing this webinar from home and uh, just to pass on at work from home hopefully good uh, broadband that will hold up and uh, we'll be able to, uh, without uh, further ado i'm going to dive as as, uh, as always chat i'll address once we are completed That we have scheduled for today. All familiar with the web and much time on it. So, at the end of our session, on in session that's left, and all, which of course, as you all know, is very critical, but that's going to be today's session sort of walk you all through, you know, the do's and what are the you all need to bear in mind. Of course, keep the questions coming towards the end of our so um last time session and as well we are uh, he has the power as contained um for the we'll all appreciate that he's really a cause means you have sort of powers uh, please uh, uh, exercise them and of course following practices that uh, on uh, on today essentially was attended that person on the power to right for you Uh, today, I'm, but the power something very under put it uh, does not appear before you whether the complainant respondent or, or witnesses or what have you. You have actually the power to get force them to appear before you by invoking what is called the recovery of arrears and the, the land revenue laws. What this means is you have the power to freeze their assets. Uh, uh, until they sort of appear before you. Now, this this power exists in theory. Um, I am yet to see or hear of an IC that has actually exercised this power, but you do know that it exists and you have that power under under the law, under the Prevention of Sexual Harassment Law. You also have the power to ask for call for discovery uh, and examination of any documents that uh, sort of may be, uh, in your view, uh, relevant in order for you to come at the correct conclusion as to uh, what has really happened in that particular matter so uh, that is that is another power that you have and of course any other matter that may be prescribed which uh, sort of loosely means that 
you have the power to call for uh, anything else that may sort of help you arrive uh, or help you do justice in this particular situation. Now, uh, jumping right into the investigation inquiry process, here are some do's and don'ts uh, for all of you who are members of the uh, internal committee or are aspiring to be members of the internal committee. These are some things that uh, bearing in mind that you are performing a quasi-judicial function. Here are some things that you must bear in mind when conducting um, sort of an investigation as uh, as an IC member or an in, in member of the internal committee under the Prevention of Sexual Harassment Law of 2013. So some of the do's that you must bear in mind is create an enabling environment. Uh, you must create an environment where um, both parties, not just the complainant but also the respondent, uh, are are comfortable. They know that um, uh, this is uh, this is a body that will hear them, that will do justice, and is not really biased towards either of the parties. It's therefore very important for you to convey that to both parties uh, in the form of a, a sort of uh, in the way your uh, sort of uh, body language is. Um, it should not be it should not be overtly aggressive. It should not be you know laid back. It's got to communicate complete attention to the parties. And uh, you know some of those things include uh, putting away your mobile phones, uh, not checking emails, messages, WhatsApp messages. Uh, or even checking, you know, opening a laptop to check uh, work emails. It is totally inappropriate because remember, uh, as an IC member, you have uh, the careers of two individuals in your hands, and therefore you must uh, treat uh, both parties with absolute respect and give them the full attention because they have come to you uh, as as somebody who they believe will give them justice, and you therefore must give them the full attention uh, and respect that they deserve when uh, an IC hearing is happening. One of the very uh, sort of uh, important things to bear in mind is that you must get or discard, get rid of or discard any um, sort of um, predetermined ideas that you may have. What are predetermined ideas? Biases, right? Uh, uh, you must remember that as a member of the IC, uh, there, is a, there is a high probability that you may uh, you know, uh, either the complainant or the respondent or both individuals may have uh, may be known to you uh, in some fashion, form or the other. They may have worked with you. They may have uh, maybe just you may have just bumped into them in the corridor or in the cafeteria or where have you. Bearing that in mind, uh, is, this is true, especially for internal members uh, of an internal committee that you have to deter, you have to discard all predetermined ideas, biases that you may have for or against an individual. You may like somebody, you may be very fond of them. Conversely, you may also have a strong bias against them to say that, you know, I don't I don't believe this person. Uh, you know, maybe you may have a bias against their, you know, moral character or or the way they conduct themselves or, or the way they dress or their, or, or even, you know, sometimes silly things like uh, caste, religion, and so on and so forth. All of those must be completely discarded when you are hearing a matter as a member of the IC. That is that is a very, very important and cardinal rule of being a member of the IC. No bias. Keep a clean mind and make sure that you are in a position to hear that party out. The only thing that matters to you as a member of the IC is the evidence that is placed before you. Not who the person is, not what their seniority is, not uh, their gender and all of those other things that I've just mentioned. It has got to be a very, very unbiased uh, approach to that. You also need to then determine the harm that has been caused to the individuals. Um, so particularly the complainant. So the complainant will come to you and say that this is what has happened to me and I'm very upset about it. And therefore, uh, it is your responsibility to ensure that you uh, sort of determine the harm that has been caused so that you're able to um, then uh, as an IC collectively get to the bottom of the matter in terms of uh, what's really happened to in that particular instance. So those are the do do's and then we can quickly move on to the don'ts as well. Um, give me a second folks. I'm just going to close my outlook so that the emails don't keep popping. Um, just give me a second. Right. So um, now the don'ts. 
some of the some of the don'ts that IC members, some of the trap, uh, you know, traps that an IC member typically tends to fall into, is basically they tend to get very aggressive during the course of an IC hearing. Sometimes this can happen because um, an IC member might feel that uh, the complainant or the respondent is uh, is sort of, you know, leading them on a wild goose chase, or they don't believe in the in the story of either party, or you know, for whatever reason, or their own biases that against that individual. So uh, the simple rule to follow in the course of an IC hearing is really that uh, don't get aggressive because aggression is is uh, is unlikely to sort of help you uh, get uh, you know resolve the matter in in a manner uh, as befitting your stature as as a sort of performing somebody who's performing a quasi judicial function. So uh, instead, try to keep a calm uh, and composed uh, a sort of uh, you know appearance and uh, demeanor when you're conducting them. Uh, Sort of IC hearing. Don't get aggressive. No, no, no loud voices. No screaming. No shouting. And conversely, of course, if any of the parties uh, are getting aggressive or uh, or sort of indulging in behavior that is inappropriate, you have a right to put your foot down and make sure that they fall in line and uh, behave according to the decorum of of, of the proceedings that you may have uh, stipulated. So, in order for us to get there, you obviously have to lead from the front as an IC member, and you have to also be conducting yourself and your team members in a manner that is befitting of an IC member. So no aggression. Um, sometimes it's a very thin line in terms of what uh, you should and shouldn't do uh, during the course of an IC workshop. So sometimes IC members feel that uh, it is important to get a really, really sort of detailed description or a graphic description of how the sexual harassment happened. This can actually be sometimes very awkward for particularly for the complainant because uh, it is. It, it, it's, it's always traumatic for somebody who's gone through uh, sexual harassment, uh, and for them to actually uh, relive the sort of uh, experience over and over and again is not the easiest thing in the world to do. So, therefore, where possible, get the information that you need um, in a manner where you are not pushing the uh, the complainant to actually get very, very give you a very, very graphic description. Because that makes the complainant very, very, very uncomfortable. So please ensure that you don't insist on that. Try and get the information that you need from the consultant in a fashion where the uh, the complainant starts getting comfortable with uh, the fact that uh, you're going to be that get them comfortable uh, in talking about the incident, what happened, and you will find that over a period of time, uh, once their comfort level is established, they will share um, whatever it is that uh, you know happened to them. So. Try to uh, ensure that you don't get too granular. Don't insist on a graphic description because those are all things that can really make uh, a complainant extremely uncomfortable and potentially then cause them to clam up or completely shut down, which is which is not in the best interests uh, of uh, of uh, sort of doing justice in this case. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, that uh, is important to kind of bear in mind is that uh, very often IC members interrupt. Uh, Either the complainant or the respondent, or even the witness, when they are in the in the sort of middle of uh, giving their testimony to you. Now, sometimes when uh, the complainant or the respondent is is sharing something with you, a question may pop up in your mind, and you may say, "Hey, I need to get an answer to this because they are basically, uh, uh, you know, there's something that comes to your mind." But what you do when you interrupt, uh, uh, you know, either whoever is speaking. You are causing them to lose their train of thought, right? So when they lose their train of thought or chain of thought or what you will, what have you, then what happens is that after they've answered your question, it'll be difficult for them to go back to where they were when you asked them the question. So what I strongly recommend to all you IC members is, and you know this rule can apply even if you are investigating a matter outside of an IC hearing. It can also be a disciplinary committee hearing. But what I would recommend is that. If you have a question that comes to mind when a party is speaking, make a note of it. Keep a notepad next to you. Keep scribbling away questions that are coming to your mind. Once the person has stopped speaking, that's the time you go through your list of questions and make sure that you get satisfactory responses to each of those questions. So all the IC members should ideally follow this uh, sort of rule of thumb to ensure that uh, you are able to get the complete information from the individuals concerned and at the same time, you are uh, you are also ensuring that you are respecting the fact that they are 
uh, in the middle of a, uh, in, in the middle of sharing something with you when uh, 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 when you choose to interrupt so respect that and ensure that they finish their uh, train of thought finish uh, speaking what they are saying and then you ask them the question that uh, that you want to right so um, <clears throat> so one of the things that uh, could happen is that when you are in the middle of a sort of um, uh, ic hearing sometimes i see members while taking a break um often make the mistake of uh, ignoring the fact that either the complainant or the respondent is in the same room as they are right and they tend to take talk freely about the case they tend to talk freely about the merits demerits pros cons what have you now that that's something that absolutely must be avoided because not just the complainant and the respondent nobody outside of the you know the members of the ic who are hearing the matter should know what you are thinking in terms of what is going on in that particular matter that thought process must be only uh, confined uh, or shared only with those of you who are hearing the matter because you need to be able to be uh, free and uh, be able to kind of uh, address and complete hearing that matter in a free and impartial manner and free from any biases right so when you discuss the pros and cons sometimes the complainant might midway uh, draw jump to the conclusion that oh this ic is biased against me they are not going to give me a favorable order they may do something rash or likewise a respondent might also feel the same way to make sure that your thinking remains only in your head and shared with only your colleagues on the ic make sure that any discussions with respect to a case cease the minute you are outside of the uh, the office or uh, conference room where you are hearing the case and uh, even in open areas and so on and so forth not to be discussed right so the confidentiality requirements of the ic begins at the top which is you the ic members you have a duty to ensure that you don't discuss the pros and cons of a complaint either in the presence of any of the parties or even witnesses or even those who are unrelated or unconnected with uh, that particular matter so that's something that's very very important for uh, all of you to bear in mind right um now i'm going to take you all through the process that we uh, sort of must follow once the um complaint has come in and the ic has sort of started the process of hearing the uh, matter so uh, please have a look at the chart that's in front of you and I'll, i'm going to walk you through that chart this is just to leave you with some very very quick uh, thoughts in terms of uh, the process that we must follow now <clears throat> at the sort of at the uh, uh, very beginning uh, the process really kicks off with uh, an examination of the respondent and an examination of uh, sort of the the complaint now th you can uh, typically uh, the complainant uh, can be examined first followed by the respondent uh, that may be the better way to do it but at the same time sometimes what happens is you get the complaint in but you haven't had time to speak to the complainant about it and therefore you have started the a uh, discussion by actually asking the respondent uh for his views in terms of what uh, what uh, what has happened in in that particular manner so examine the respondent examine the complainant these are the two things that you sort of do to kick off the uh, uh investigation process thereafter uh, if that is a matter that has witnesses then you need to also summon the witnesses one by one and do it in a manner where there is sufficient time between each witness so that you you want to avoid a situation where witnesses are bumping into each other as far as possible one person who is a witness in the case should not know that person b or person c is also a witness in the case uh, so that's your way to ensure that the circle of confidentiality is tight and uh, is not breached because two witnesses uh, realize that they are both witnesses to the same case and they started talking about it and sometimes that kind of conversation can be very loose uh, outside of uh, the office and uh, things get around so uh someone witnesses but in a way that they don't bump into each other or they're unaware that the other is a witness uh also call for proof at this point of time so um any evidences that may be there uh, in that particular case both from the complainant or the respondent or even <clears throat> any other proof that you believe is necessary that may not have been uh there in either the complaint or the uh, written response but you believe it's necessary basis your reading of the two documents you can call for that right as an ic you have a full power to call for uh, whatever evidence you believe is necessary but don't just go by the evidence that is put before you by the 
two parties. You should apply your own uh, in, uh, sort of uh, objective judgment, and uh, and and if required, ask for more evidence that can help you uh, sort of arrive at uh, what is the kind of information that is necessary. A very important component of uh, the hearing uh, process is really the interim relief, and interim relief is basically that uh, relief that the IC may at its uh, discretion provide to uh, either party, but more or less it's really designed to give the complainant comfort in, in terms of uh, continuing uh, while she's ongoing, uh, while she's sort of in the middle of the matter. So for example, and we had discussed this in our prior webinars and prior sessions, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but interim reliefs could uh, range from uh, allowing the complainant uh, to work from a different office, to work from home, or even to take leave. You're, you are allowed to provide up, up to three months of paid leave uh, paid leave uh, to the complainant uh, while the case is ongoing, right? But this discretion is yours. The complainant uh, uh, can only make the request, uh, or if the respondent has a requirement, they can make a request. But remember that the final call remains uh, with you and uh, is your call. So uh, don't get browbeaten by either party. Remember, you have the power to, uh, you have the final power and final authority rests with you in terms of deciding what you believe is the right way to move forward with respect to interim relief. Uh, <clears throat> thereafter, you uh, start the process of examination of witnesses. So you you call the witnesses that uh, the complainant has listed out. You call the witnesses that the respondent has listed out one by one. You may want to first examine all the witnesses of the complainant, make your notes, and then on, a, on another day or a few days later, start the process of examining the respondent's witnesses, make your documentation and all of that, and then sort of ensure that once all of that is done, uh, you are then sort of in a place where you have sufficient uh, first picture in terms of what needs to be done on this particular matter. Thereafter, there is something called re-examination, which is you may want to then call back the complainant and the respondent. Now you have, remember, now you have a lot of evidence in front of you, right? You've got proof, you've got uh, witnesses, you've spoken to witnesses, you've examined the witnesses, you've made your notes, right? You now have at this stage a far better understanding of how the uh, case is progressing, right? You now have a clearer picture. You may not have the full picture, but you have a clearer picture of what's happened in the matter. At this point in time, you may decide now to <clears throat> sort of do what is called a re-examination. So you may call back either the complainant or the respondent or both and ask them questions again. This is the information that you have now received or obtained from, uh, you know, the steps that we have discussed earlier. So make sure that you now have all of the information that you need from uh, examining, uh, re-examining both parties. And then now you move to the uh, sort of crucial stage of the, of the IC hearing, which is cross-examination. Now, what is cross-examination? Cross-examination essentially is the ability of one party to ask questions of the other party, right? So at this point of time, the complainant may have questions for the respondent. The respondent may have questions for the complainant. So at this point of time, you allow you as the <clears throat> IC will be facilitating questions between the, uh, you know, where the complainant asks questions of the respondent and vice versa. Now, cross-examination can be very, very tricky, and it has to be handled extremely delicately. So typically, cross-examination, as many of you may know, uh, is actually handled by the lawyers of each party, right? Where they cross-examine the other party and the witnesses. However, as you know, cross-examination is, uh, there are no lawyers that are allowed in, uh, in, in, in a cross-examination, uh, in a IC hearing. Therefore, uh, by extension, no lawyers are allowed to sort of also conduct cross-examination. So therefore, uh, it is it is sort of critical that you as the IC manage the entire process of cross-examination. So some common pitfalls to avoid. One, uh, please ensure that the complainant is comfortable with being cross-examined in person by the respondent, right? harassment that has happened can leave a and she may not to face with the respondent. It is your duty to ensure that before you permit cross-examination, you check with the complainant uh, that she is comfortable with being cross-examined by the respondent. You may also want to check with the respondent whether he is okay with being cross-examined by the complainant. Largely though, that's never an issue. 
but if the complainant has a problem, then you have to uh, sort of be a little innovative. Then there are two other ways in which you can complete the cross-examination. You can ask the complainant to list their uh, set of questions and hand it over to you. You can ask the respondent to uh, send their list of questions and hand it over to you. Then you complete the cross-examination on behalf of either party. So you ask the complainant questions that the respondent wants asked of the complainant. Likewise, you ask questions of the respondent uh, that the complainant may have wanted to ask, and you get the responses. The third way to, or the second way to kind of complete the cross-examination cross -examin cross without the parties coming face to face is basically take the questions down in writing from both parties and share it with the other party. So complainant gives their questions uh, in writing and uh, you share it with the respondent. Respondent does the same, you share it with the complainant, give them both uh, a day or two or three or four or whatever it is that is necessary depending on the number of questions uh, that are there and share it with both parties and thereafter you can, um, <clears throat> once that is done, ask them both to send their responses back to you and then you can move ahead with the process. So these are these are the things that you must bear in mind. Remember cross-examination. If the golden rule to remember is if a complainant is not comfortable, then do not insist on a face-to-face cross-examination. -cross Either you as the IC can conduct it or it can be done in writing. So that's a, that's something that is very important and I want to kind of share with you and leave with you. Um, thereafter, if there's any further questioning that needs to be done, you can ask uh, uh, those questions of uh, all of the other <clears throat> parties involved, including other witnesses and so on and so forth. And if all of that is clear, then you can now move away from the whole uh, examination, re-examination, cross-examination, questioning piece. You would have now at this point of time completed the entire set. Two thirds or more of the IC hearing is over at this point of time. The critical part is over. Uh, now the last part that is here is really the segment where you as the IC, the three or four or five of you huddle over of, uh, you know, get together and then decide <clears throat> how you feel about this particular matter. So at this point in time, you're going to identify inconsistencies in, say, the statement of the complainant or the statement of the respondent or the statement of the witnesses. You have to basically now start pulling threads from all of the information that you have to see who is a more credible uh, witness, whose testimony had greater, uh, you know, weightage. Whose testimony can you rely on? Whose, which evidence can you play greater reliance on? All of these things then is something that now you start putting your heads together to figure out. So this is where the deliberations happen. You may need an hour, many hours, days to kind of hash this out amongst you. And then ultimately you come to the conclusion as to what you believe has happened in this particular manner, in this particular matter. And that's where your findings come into play. This is the point of time where you start noting down your findings and you either say that the complainant is as sort of proved uh, her case uh, on, a, on a balance of probabilities. And that concept we will come to later on in the session or, or she's not been able to make out a case and therefore uh, you rule in favor of the respondent, etc. So any of those things can happen. You put your findings together, agree on it, and then ultimately you have to then start the process of drafting the report and sharing that with uh, with all the parties. Uh, sorry, uh, sharing the report with both parties as well as a version of that report will be shared with the management. So this is the process to be followed in a nutshell. Uh, like I said, this is actually something that we cover in a one day workshop or a two day workshop. But given the paucity of time, what we are trying to do is compress all of this into a little capsule for you so that all of you can you have enough of a basis or a framework that you can use to uh, sort of complete uh, uh, an IC training uh, on your own. Right. So moving on, um, we will now we have already covered um, interim measures uh, in two sessions before this. So I don't want to spend too much time on uh, on interim measures because this is something that we have already covered uh, in two sessions. but. As you can see on the slide, uh, the interim measures that need to be taken sort of can involve any of the following. Uh, but the first one comes into play, uh, you know, uh, which is which is basically the change in reporting structure that comes into play in the event the the respondent is the complainant's manager, and that is something that you will need to do to ensure that 
uh, the, the respondent is able to continue working without any difficulty. Um, as a consequence of changing the reporting structure, you may need to also restrain the respondent from commenting or reporting on the work performance of the complainant. This is natural because you have a situation where a complaint has been made by one person against another, irrespective of whether uh, there is merit in the complaint or not. Uh, it's natural, it's human tendency that you will not be in a position to uh, sort of um, do, uh, you know, be able to evaluate that professional objectively as your, uh, you know, sort of reporting. So it's always better to, the IC needs to change the reporting structure in that particular situation. Uh, suspending the respondent is also something that you can do if you believe that it's required in the interests of um, justice. But remember something, uh, this is this is really, you know, I, I call this, uh, you know, I call this sort of like a brahmastra that you must use very, very carefully because suspension can sometimes, um, suspension often uh, leads to a, a, a view that a person is guilty and the respondent might not take uh, you know, suspension very well. And, uh, uh, also it can, it can cause a lot of, uh, sort of, uh, unhappiness or, uh, you know, amongst a lot of people, it can, it may be able to sort, it may lead to the organization having difficulties in adjusting many things, right? But here's, here's the thing. Suspension is also something that you need to use at the right time. So for example, Let's say that you have warned the respondent and you told the respondent that you need to work from home. We do not want you contacting any employees of the company. We do not want you coming into office and meeting people because we believe you may influence witnesses. So can you avoid being uh, uh, sort of doing any of those things until we close the matter? Uh, the respondent says yes, but you find out that the respondent has not, um, uh, the respondent has not uh, sort of how do I put it? Complied with your order, and <clears throat> they have decided to go ahead and breach your uh, order in flagrant, uh, flagrant violation, flagrant violation of your order. They have decided to contact witnesses and other people and try to essentially maybe influence the outcome of the matter. That's where you need to step in. You need to ensure that at that point of time, uh, speak to the respondent and say, "Hey, listen, we gave, we did tell you not to do this. You have done it in violation of our orders. Uh, so kindly." we have no choice but to suspend you. Something like that would be a, a scenario in which you use suspension as a tool, right? Any other me measures that you believe are required to ensure business continuity and most importantly, record any measure that you do, either interim or final, and make sure that uh, you, their implementation is monitored, right? So that's, that's very, very uh, critical. So um, that's where we are on the interim measures. Uh, I want to spend a couple of minutes on examination of witnesses. Uh, so examination tips are here. Just, uh, sorry. Yeah. So uh, the next couple of slides will focus really on sort of uh, tips around examination. And then, you know, what are the ways in which you can examine a witness? Uh, this is very, very critical for all of you as members of the IC. So here are some tips really uh, kind of uh, for you to pay attention and for you to kind of internalize and use as a part of uh, uh, you know the examination process make sure you take records of the interview uh, take proper notes uh, uh, if you can't uh, very often we find that it is distracting for an ic member to be also taking minutes or notes while at the same time uh, be asking questions so what we always recommend is that uh, if you can do an audio recording and if both parties don't have an objection to it by all means, uh, record uh, the entire session. Uh, but of course, you have to make sure that it is stored properly in a secure manner so that it cannot be accessed by anybody else um, other than <clears throat> whoever is uh, sort of on the IC at that point of time. Uh, the presiding officer has a very clear that the interviews are properly carried out, the process is followed, every person is given a chance to be heard. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, every individual must come in a particular sequence and uh, uh, preferably, uh, not just preferably, but uh, as far as possible, no, uh, I, uh, no witness should sort of bump into another witness. So they need to all be aware that um, uh, at this point, uh, you know, they need to not know who the other people involved in this matter are. They should just come give their testimony and leave. Uh, at the end of uh, you know, a particular session uh, of uh, 
examining witnesses or what have you, make sure that you document it, print it out, and get uh, that person, either the complainant respondent or the witness, to sign that statement. So this ensures that uh, you know you have uh, both an audio recording and, and a signed statement to sort of uh, in case somebody says that no, no, but this is not what I said or that's not what I said. You've got proper records of what really happened. Excuse me. So uh, as I uh, sort of briefly touched upon previously, please make sure that uh, you uh, touch up, determine well in advance the date, time, place, and order of the interviews. Right. For every individual, you need to make sure that all of that is already sort of in place, um, so that you don't have individuals bumping into each other when interviews are happening. Um, please be prepared with the questions, list of questions that you're going to be asking the individuals. You need to be prepared so that at the IC hearing, you don't appear unprepared and you are you can't be doing this, uh, you know, by the seat of your pants, uh, so to speak. You've got to be prepared. You've got to have your questions in place and go in that order. Keep um, taking notes as you go along, but go in that order and make sure that uh, all your questions are asked and answered. Um, schedule sufficient time for each interview. So if you believe a person might only take about 30 minutes, schedule maybe an hour and a half. This is to ensure that sometimes or many or very often you'll find that individuals take more time. You may need more time because more questions need to be asked depending on uh, you know what you what you come up with in that particular sort of uh, discussion. So that's uh, that's always uh, strongly recommended. And of course, try to keep your questions uh, open ended related to who, what, when, where and how. This is to ensure that uh, you get maximum information out of the individual. Uh, closed ended questions, which typically a person can answer in a yes or no, uh, prevents the person from, you know, sort of giving you more information. So generally ask open ended questions. But when you need to zero in on a, a particular uh, uh, incident or a question and you need a yes no answer by all means uh, you must use that because that is uh, absolutely necessary in order for you to uh, come to the sort of uh, <clears throat> arrive at uh, um, you know an understanding of what really happened in that particular case so use both largely open-ended questions where to elicit information from the individuals but use closed-ended questions which re which result in a yes no answer where you need to be specific and where you need information uh, that uh, that is important to determining that particular case right okay so i'm going to take a pause now uh, we're kind of sort of uh, midway through um, i don't see any questions so i think we're okay i just hope that uh, people are able to uh, you know audio issues and other things are resolved now and everybody's able to hear audio carefully all right. The other critical aspect with respect to examination of witnesses is you must get the details from the witness in their own words. Give them an opportunity to speak. The more people speak, uh, the more it helps you identify inconsistencies. The more you allow a witness or a complainant or a respondent to speak, the more you realize or the more inconsistencies that may pop up in either of their statements. So allow people to speak, get details from them do not fall into the trap of prompting them uh, any individual prompting them as to hey uh, you know they may be talking about they may be searching for a word or so, uh, trying to explain what they did be patient let them um, let them continue or complete the train of thought uh, because sometimes prompting may have uh, a reverse effect in terms of what that it may that person may end up saying uh, something different from what they had originally intended so try not to prompt uh, watch the witness, watch the body language, uh, make sure you're listening carefully to what they are, uh, you know, how their body language is. And of course, wait for the answer. Don't try to cut them off midway. Don't try to interrupt them. Let them speak and let them finish the answer and pay close attention. Pay, pay close attention to what they are saying through their body language and also through the words that they are speaking. If something is not clear, uh, when there is a pause, you're welcome to actually uh, stop and ask them to clarify what they meant, uh, you know, by that particular statement or comment or what have you. So there's nothing wrong with actually seeking a clarification from an individual uh, if it is not clear. So by all means, it's all right to actually clarify a statement uh, and ask additional questions, right? All right. 
so now um, we come to uh, sort of recording of information, a, a really very critical aspect of NIC's function. Uh, it is important for you to record every single interaction, every conversation, uh, so that your uh, your you know your sort of uh, records are properly maintained. Remember that um, your matter could go on appeal to a higher court, and a higher court may ask you for uh, any kind of uh, information or uh, anything or, or records of of the matter, and you will need to share that with uh, with that uh, court. So. Please make sure that you record everything carefully. Maintain accurate and up-to-date records. Uh, don't leave it for later because, yes, we do realize that IC members also have another job. This is not what they do full-time. But at the same time, on every case, make sure that you uh, cover off all the points uh, and keep your records up-to-date. They have to be stored securely with very restricted access. Only members of the IC can access it. So storage can be both by way of um, in the digital world, so in a cloud, so make sure you work with your IT department to store it securely in the cloud with only the four or five or six of you, how many of our members are on your IC who have access to that information. And also keep a copy as a backup in, in, the, in the physical world as well. I have a dedicated storage space for, uh, for the IC. Don't commingle it with uh, legal or finance or HR or any other function. The IC has got to have its own storage space. Um, that uh, that is not shared with anybody else because a lot of the information that you have is confidential. And um, be proactive in uh, in sort of uh, communicating uh, promptly and effectively with uh, with uh, all stakeholders that are involved in that particular matter, so that uh, at all points of time everybody knows where they stand and where they are. So to uh, in terms of uh, your key responsibilities, uh, I know it's stating the obvious, but you have to be thoroughly prepared with the facts uh, of a particular case, who said what to whom, when and where. Um, know the act uh, uh, sort of inside out uh, as far as possible. Uh, know the policy and the rules of your organization uh, very, very clearly so that uh, you, you don't end up uh, in your orders writing something that is inconsistent with the, what either the act or the policy or your own rules say that's going to make you look very, very uh, silly. Mm, gather and record all relevant information. We have just covered how you do that in the form of getting data and information from all uh, uh, all the parties, complainant, respondent, uh, witnesses, etc. Important for you to determine the main issues in a complaint. So what's the main issue? It's basically the heart of what the complaint is about. Uh, is it uh, is it that a person felt uncomfortable, the complainant felt uncomfortable because somebody spoke to her in a particular manner? So what is the main issue? And uh, then you work around that main issue to figure out uh, whether that um, particular incident happened or not. So everything that you do, examination, cross-examination, etc., is then sort of uh, weaved around uh, this particular aspect, which is the main issues in a complaint. Uh, we have already discussed this. Make sure you ask all the relevant examination questions and ask, make a list of it beforehand. Do not go in unprepared for an IC hearing. Make sure you have a list of questions and ask all of those questions. Check them off uh, one by one. Uh, conduct the necessary examination. Please ensure that the parties are made of their, made aware of their rights and responsibilities. Uh, they need to know, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, the complainant needs to know that she has a right to conciliation, right? Uh, as, a, as a means to resolve the conflict or to resolve a complaint. So that should be made available or made known to her right at the very beginning so that she has the option to exercise, you know, uh, uh, whether to go in for conciliation or not, or interim measures, many things, right? So make sure that the parties are aware of their rights and responsibilities. And ultimately, of course, uh, you have to file, prepare a report with all of the findings and uh, your recommendations. So this is basically, um, uh, <clears throat> long and short of really the key responsibilities of, of the IC, right? All right, so now this, I've kind of summarized how the entire process works for all of you. I'm just going to spend a few minutes on a very, very important aspect of uh, being uh, on, uh, you know, sort of uh, on an IC. Uh, you may be all familiar with this, Lady Justice. What, uh, what, what does Lady Justice really signify? And this is very important for each and every member of you who's uh, each and every one of you who's a member of an IC, 
right? What Lady Justice signifies, and you may have seen this in n number of Hindi movies, so I don't really need to sort of uh, remind you of uh, who she is. But the importance is of the significance. So the scales in her hand signify, uh, you know, sort of the primarily uh, that she weighs both the claims of both parties on a scale and then comes to a conclusion as to, uh, you know, who's right and who's not, right? So that's one part, of course. Um, Lady Justice also, it it's also signifies the fact that um, the balance of the individual needs against the balance of society also must be taken into consideration when she's arriving at her verdict, right? So that's that's one. The second part is blindfold, which again is very, very important for each and every one of you. Remember that uh, the blindfold is critical because you need to be completely, the blindfold really signifies um, the fact that you're going to be unbiased um, and uh, completely impartial and your view is not going to be influenced by either the either of the parties, who they are, what they are, etc. Right. So we discussed this previously, but that's what the blindfold uh, sort of signifies. And it's very important that each and every one of you remembers that impartiality, lack of bias is one of the most important uh, duties that you have as as an IC member. And last but not the least, enforcement measures. The sword signifies your ability to punish the wrongdoer, whether it is the respondent for having indulged in a case of sexual harassment or the complainant for having filed a false complaint. Either way, the sword is, is, is to remind you that you have the power to take action against an individual if they have done something wrong. Right? So this is something that each and every one of you must bear in mind when you're hearing a case. Remember, this is very, very critical. Uh, the scales of justice. Remember, you've got to ensure that you're uh, weighing both uh, scales before you come to a conclusion. The blindfold, which is your lack of bias, and the sword, which is your, your uh, ability to punish an individual. Right? So that's uh, sort of lady justice now. You have to remember one thing, and this is uh, more often than many in many instances, I've realized that IC members don't quite realize what is the basis on which they have to come to a conclusion. So you are as a member of an IC, you basically are a civil court, like a civil court. OK, you have to in a civil in civil cases, um, the court arrives at a decision on the basis of what is called balance of probabilities, right? This is the, the opposite of criminal cases or rather different from criminal cases where it is uh, where facts have to be proved beyond reasonable doubt. What is beyond reasonable doubt? It means that the all that the defendant in a criminal complaint needs to do is cast a doubt on the prosecution and that is sufficient for the court to rule in favor of the defendant. Why is that? Because in criminal cases, you take away the you you have the right uh, to take away the liberty of uh, the defendant, right? A person can be put behind bars and in jail. So it is the prosecution's job is that much tougher. Now, in civil cases, it's different, and this is what concerns us as IC IC members, right? We are as a part of um, as an IC member, you're really performing the function of a civil court. Here, you don't go by beyond reasonable doubt as a standard of but uh, proof you go by what is called balance of probabilities or preponderance of probabilities what does that mean balance of probability really means that the chance of something having occurred is just a little more than that of it not having occurred what does that mean very very simply put the balance of probabilities rule is basically a standard of proof satisfying a judge or a jury that the facts at issue probably occurred probably not beyond reasonable doubt but probably occurred as alleged sometimes referred to as preponderance of the evidence or a 51 percent likelihood of occurrence very simply put i call this the 51 percent rule which means you as the ic member when you're hearing a case you need to be only satisfied that one person's case is just slightly higher than the other person's. So if the scales are like this, if it is slightly tilted in favor of one individual, that person is the one who wins and the other person loses. That's called the 
uh, standard of proof for balance of probabilities. When you're in doubt, just remember the 51% rule. So for example, the complainant does not have to prove beyond reasonable doubt and give you all of the evidence that, uh, uh, that you may need in a criminal trial. But very simply put, if you, after assessing the evidence of the complainant and after assessing the evidence of the respondent, you feel that the complainant's case is slightly higher. That's all you need in order to rule in favor of the complainant that this was a case of sexual harassment. Conversely, in the event that the respondent is able to prove to you that his case is slightly higher than the complainant, then on balance of probabilities, you rule in his favor or whoever the uh, respondent is. So that is what is called balance of probabilities or the 51% rule. When you are sitting down to deliberate and draft your order, <clears throat> you must remember this rule uh, whenever you're doing that, because this is the critical rule that allows you to determine who is uh, the party in whose favor you are going to rule. Right? So that uh, sort of brings us to an end of uh, today's uh, uh, session. Um, happy to take questions now. I'm sure. There are a few, so we can take questions. And remember that the next session, I think that's on December 13th, is going to focus on order writing. So we'll spend uh, some time on order writing. That's a very, very critical uh, session for all you IC members. So I want to make sure that all of you are uh, get maximum value from that. So do register for that session.